How is everyone tonight? Are you tired? Because I'm going to fry your brain with facts and history, so. <laughs> no! It's needful, but it's only once, and I won't do it again the rest of the year, I think. <laughs> I, I realized this morning when I was getting ready how rebellious I, I still am. It is the um, first day of fall, first day of Bible study. I was in Austin on Thursday and Friday, and, and they are a little more fashionable than we are in California. And uh, the first person I ran into Friday morning, I had these white pants on, and she goes, you don't wear white after Labor Day. And I said, well, I do. <laughs> I'm from California. And then I realized, all right, today's officially the first day of fall, and I thought, you know, I'm not ready for fall yet. I'm still going to wear white. So that's what God has to work with. He's tamed me a lot. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Father... Thank you so much for your ability to tame us. God, for your ability to come alongside us and change us and make us more like you. For the way you love us, Lord, in spite of us. For the way you handle us when we fail and flail and are weak. God, we thank you for everything about you. And Lord, we thank you that we are right here in this place, able to study your word Thank you that your word is faithful because it's your word. And so, God, would you clear our minds, perk us up tonight, and, and help us to get everything you have for us, Lord. And I know you've got some real heart stuff in, in some of these verses that you want to specifically speak to individuals tonight. So we tell you right now, speak to us. We're open. We want to hear from you. We want to be ministered to by you, Lord because you're just so very good at it. So, Lord, may we walk out of here different than we came tonight, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are basically going to cover the same period of time that we did in last year's Bible study, or at least a portion of it. We're going to study two more psalms, uh, which I'm really excited about the, the two psalms that we'll be working on, and then three books, mostly written by King Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastics, Song of Solomon. And then we're going to look at four major pro prophets and 12 minor prophets. Now, when we say major pro prophets, they're only major because they've written bigger books. They're not more important in God's eyes, or they weren't even used more uh, extensively by the Lord. And so we've got four major prophets and 12 what are called minor prophets. And as we study, these books aren't in chronological order. So the four major prophets are all together, but they span a different period of time. They'll cover from, say, 740 B.C. to 570 B.C. with Ezekiel, starting with Isaiah. So less than 200 years of the, the major prophets. Now, in last year's study, we covered Genesis, which began, we, our best guess is 4,000 B.C., to Abraham, beginning that nation of Israel about 2,000 years later in about 2100 B.C., to the Exodus in Egypt in about 1440 B.C. See how fast that ran? I mean, just look at Genesis and Exodus. We've, we've covered uh, 2,500 years. And then the period of Judges, about 65, 70 years later, and that lasted about 330 years. That period when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They, they went into the promised land. They started having judges ruling them. Uh, but very quickly were not honoring God. But rather they were doing what they felt was the right thing to do. And then they wanted a king. First king, King Saul. And he reigned about 1041 B.C. to 1011 B.C. Just right around 30 years. And that's when David became king. Now, after David, his son Solomon reigned. After Solomon's death, the kingdom was divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So David, or Saul, David, Solomon, all one kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. But then after Solomon's death, there was a split with his sons, and there became the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom. Southern kingdom contained the city of Jerusalem. Now, we studied First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, which really covered the history of Israel, uh, was Samuel as the last judge, and, and Saul as the first king. And then 
They covered all the kings of the northern kingdom and all the kings of the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom was captured by Assyria in about 722 BC, and the Babylonians captured southern kingdom about 136 later, years later in 586 BC. Now, I said that all in, what, three, four minutes, and you know how long it took me to study to do all of that? So, so all of that information is important to see the, the history we looked at books that were written during and after their captivity when we studied Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So all that to say, if you were here during last year's study, we studied biblical history up to the founding of the nation with Abraham, to Israel's captivity, through the captivity, to their return to Jerusalem, ending about 400 years before the birth of Christ. So last year, we covered about 4,000 years of biblical history. So you might be sitting here thinking, okay, what's left? You know, if we studied from Genesis to the 400 years before Christ was born, that's what the Old Testament is about. What are all these other books about that it's really half of the Old Testament? We're going to study, rather than 4,000 years, we're going to look at about 400 years and it's about men that God spoke to and God telling him, what I tell you, I want you to tell the people. It's, not, it's more of a revelation of the heart of God than we saw last year, and we saw a lot of the heart of God last year. Last year was a lot more history than we will see as we study this year. Now, although his people, as a people in the Old Testament, uh, were Jews, God's heart hasn't changed for his people. So the revelation of his heart that we see as we will study and we did study um, is the same. But sadly, his people haven't changed either. We, we look at the Jews and we've got all kinds of critical attitudes towards them. But when I looked at words that describe the Jews, I thought, that's us. We're still selfish. We're still rebellious. We're still half-hearted repenters. We're still non-repenters. We're still promises to do right after we failed. We're still fearful. We're still stubborn. We're still ungrateful, untrusting people. Nothing has changed. God's people can still be described as, as the Jews were. And we're going to see or glean the way that God responds to his people that behave like that. And now I use the word way singular instead of ways plural for a reason because as I thought about the way God responds to us, he's not inconsistent. And, and I love that about him. Can you imagine if you sinned and you came to God and you confessed your sin and he had ways of dealing with you? In other words, he might say, well, I'm going to wait about six months before I work in your life again. Or you're going to pay right now, big time. Or you're going to wait about 15 years, and then I'm going to lower the boom on you. You know, God says, you confess your sin, he's faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That is his way. And I, I love that we can depend on him to just do what he has said to do and not, not wonder and, and be afraid. He's not inconsistent. We can trust him to, to behave as he is and as he has promised. You see, we're going to spend most of our time what studying what God has told men to tell his people, which means we're going to spend most of our time studying what God has to say to his people, both when we've messed up and when we've done it right. How he warned of judgment, and often he had to carry it out, yet times he warned of judgment, when his people repented, we are told that God relented. And we're going to look at what does that mean when God relents? Because there's times when God doesn't carry out the judgment he warns of. Not that he predicts, but he warns of. And we'll see his heart of love and grace and what he desires for his people. And he's given his people a lot of power when you, when you think about it because it's really up to you and to me whether he shows us judgment or grace, isn't it? How we handle the sin that we have committed. And it's going to be very important that we 
understand what God is like because the God of the Old Testament has got a really bad rap, hasn't he? You know, people say he's judgmental, he's, he's out to get us, and I've showed you these slides before, but some of you haven't seen them. There's an exterminator in Orange County called Truly Nolan, and sometimes we see God as that one, he's kind of pointing at us like you, like you would an insect with a mallet behind his back, like I'm just waiting for you to blow it, and when you blow it, you know, wham, and, and that's how we see God sometimes, and, and really, let's be realistic, how long do you think God would have to point his finger at you or me to, to say, hey, there, you blew it, you know, milliseconds, but yet, this isn't our God, you know, the cross is about, I didn't come to get you, I came to save you, and so, we can't see God like this. Or, or this picture, this picture is a picture of a police car. Now, what does a police car have written on the side? To protect and to serve. Now, how many of you, when you're driving and you look up in your rear view mirror, do you say, ah, oh, there he is, he's to protect and to serve me? You don't, do you? And, and right away, you think, I must be doing something wrong. And, and we do this with God. You know, God says, I am here to protect you, to love you, to show you grace. And then, then we do something wrong, and it's, what's he going to do to me? He says he's watching me all the time. Is he really watching me to do good in my life? And so we've got to see, and we will see through these chapters that we're going to be looking at how gracious God is and then has God has much to say in these chapters or these books about the promised Messiah the one who Isaiah 9 6 says for unto us a child is born Jesus coming in the flesh unto us a son is given Jesus as God being given to us and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It is estimated that there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that predict the first and second comings of Jesus. I printed out a list yesterday of, that had 353 verses. Some, I would say, would might be a little bit of a stretch, but most of them were right on. The last prophecies in the Old Testament were spoken 400 years before the birth of Christ. At the time of the birth of Christ, 400 years, that's a long time to not hear from a prophet, to not hear from the Lord. That would be like the last person speaking about Christ's second return to us living in about the 1600s and just hearing about someone saying, Jesus is going to come again way back then. We might tend to want to ignore it, have some doubts, or reach the point of not caring or not expecting Jesus to return at all. But he did come. See, as he said, he would come the first time it was, was prophesied. And that's very important for us to see that just as he was so faithful to fulfill all of those promises about the first coming, we can count on him to fulfill all of those for the second. I read a study that was done to understand the odds of Jesus being able to fulfill just eight of the prophecies. Some of you have heard about it, but, but I thought it would be good to talk about tonight. Um, the, for example, the study concluded that the chance of one man being born in Bethlehem at the time Jesus was born is about one in 300,000. Pretty good odds, pretty bad odds. After examining only eight different prophecies, just eight, they conservatively estimated that the chance of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies was one to the 17th degree, or 10 to the 17th degree. That's 10 with 17 zeros after it. I don't even know what that number would be called. Big number. See, how much is that? 10 followed by 17 zeros. And so the illustration that they came up with is first they started with, okay, what's the chance of someone fulfilling a, uh, having one, to t one in 10 odds? I said, what if I took a hat, took 10 tickets, marked one of them, put all the tickets in the hat, and chose one of you, blindfolded you, and said, reach in, pull out a ticket. Your, your chance would be one in 10 that you'd pull out the ticket that I marked. So one in 10 to the 17th degree, they likened under taking the state of Texas, the entire state of Texas, pouring silver dollars over the entire state of Texas two feet deep. 
I'm marking one of those silver dollars. Now, my mathematical brain kicked in, and, and that is 15 trillion square feet of silver dollars. And I marked one. Somebody, bulldozer went in, mixed them all up, blindfolded one of you, and said, okay, walk across anywhere you want in the state of Texas, and then reach down and pick up one silver dollar. The chances of you picking the one I marked is as is, is slim, slim, as great as Jesus being the one. He had to be the one. All of those prophecies, it was just like one in 10 to the 70th degree could fulfill that. And you look at those kind of odds. But see, these prophets, and written by different men, but you look at the odds if man could do that. But see, the odds with God doing it is one to one. God said, here's where, where my son will be born. Here's how he will be born. Here's how he will die. It's one on one chance, you know, because God said it. It's definitely going to happen. And so we get to study some of these things in the Old Testament. And from these figures, it's been concluded that the fulfillment of these eight prophecies alone proves that God inspired the writing of the prophecies. If we look at the odds of one man fulfilling 48, uh, I told you eight, 48 of the prophecies, it's 10 to the 157th degree. Now, they actually gave an illustration of that, and I was trying to get a hold of it to explain it to you, and I, I couldn't. So just picture how great of odds that would be. But the study concluded, any man who rejects Christ as a son of God is rejecting a fact, proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact in the world. But see, someone that rejects Jesus Christ, is, it's not the big thing that they're rejecting facts. The most powerful thing of the presentation of who Jesus is, is the Holy Spirit. And God holds us accountable to rejecting the moving of the Holy Spirit, not rejecting the facts of the odds that Jesus could fulfill these prophecies. A mathematician said this, God so thoroughly vindicated Jesus Christ that even mathematicians and statisticians who were without faith had to acknowledge that it's scientifically impossible to deny that Jesus is the Christ. But we're talking about the head. When I, when I typed that yesterday, I thought about what I was like before I got saved. And Dale, I was raised in church. I, I knew the Bible very, very well, and Dale didn't. He came home from a military assignment uh, saved. And I didn't like the change at first. And, and he had this joy that I couldn't figure out because I never had a joy in following Jesus I knew so much more than he did, and I, and I wanted the joy, but I had this part of me that was like, I don't want to be a fool. I don't want to sink my life into someone or something that isn't real, that's, that's going to make me look foolish, that's going to let me down. I wanted facts, and, and as I, I looked at these facts that I, I just shared with you, I thought, oh, if I could have had those facts when I was searching at that time in my mentality, that would have been, that was what I was looking for, I thought. But this pastor would come and he talked to me three different times for two hours each time. And, and I would fold my little 21-year-old arms and just say, I want facts, prove to me. And he'd look at me and he'd smile and he'd say, you can't come to God on facts. You've got to come in faith. And, and that just was, no, I can't do that. You've got to prove to me it's real so I can follow it. And he, third time, I remember he backed up towards my door. And on the way out, he looked at me and he said, well, then I'm going to pray you're miserable till you give your life to Jesus. And he left. And, and I was. And I had to figure this thing out. But in my stubbornness, it was still, I got to figure this out, this whole Jesus thing out but I need facts. So I went and bought a Bible as history book, and I, I read that thing cover to cover, all the facts that prove the validity of the Bible, but it didn't touch my heart. I was still trying to work on my head, and after a couple months, I got so frustrated that I just got down on my knees, and I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want to follow you. And all that factual head stuff 
hit my heart. Because it's the Holy Spirit that, that quickens us, that, that causes us to want to reach out and want Jesus. He didn't show me Jesus through facts. He showed me Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, I knew because my spirit bore witness. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That doesn't happen by just an acknowledgement of facts. You know that. You know, when you came to that saving knowledge of Jesus, it wasn't the facts. It was something that was touching your heart that you knew, I want this. I need this God. I need this Savior. It's the Holy Spirit that makes the things of God real to us, not the facts. And for me, facts confirm my faith, but they don't convince me to believe outside of the moving of the Holy Spirit. And I thought about 2,000 years ago, the church was given a commission, preach the gospel, go out to all the world and preach the gospel. And 2,000 years, people have been receiving the gospel and giving their lives to Christ, that message that they preached. But I thought about what if the gospel was preached without the power of the Holy Spirit? What if through these 2,000 years, men actually came to people and said, do you realize you're a sinner? And this man lived X amount of years ago, for us 2,000 years ago. He came and he walked this earth and he was sinless and he died on the cross. And then he was buried and he rose again on the third day. And if you want to go to heaven, you need to accept that fact. You know, we, we would just go, what? What? That's your answer? But see, when someone presents those words and the Holy Spirit is behind them, what happens? It's like, ah, there's something that says, yes, that story's true. Yes, I want that. So so we're going to get facts, but what facts do for us is they kind of strengthen our faith. They confirm our faith. It's just like, yes, this, this is so true, and it helps us talk to others and There'll be good things. Facts are good. I love facts. But they confirm. They increase our faith. But, but I don't think anyone can come to any kind of faith and knowledge of God through facts. Now, in studying God's word to his people through his prophets, we will glean much. And that will include many prophecies about Jesus. And as I said, in, in seeing that Jesus fulfilled every single one relating to his first coming... It will strengthen our faith that indeed he will just as surely come again. And see, that fact, the Bible says, will strengthen our faith and our joy and purify us as 1 John 3, 3 says, everyone who has this hope of Jesus coming again purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, pure here, as it refers to Jesus, is, is like we would think it would. It's perfect, pure, pure blameless, and, excuse me, innocent. That's Jesus. But the word translated purifies here is a little bit different. It refers to some of those things, but the sense is, it's a sense of preparing oneself to participate. And I love that definition. See, and everyone who has this hope that Jesus is coming again prepares himself to participate. When I think of something I'm excited about, I prepare myself to participate. When I know something is good and it's in store for me, I'm different because of that. So as we see in a clearer way all the predictions about Jesus coming again, the effect of that should cause us to be women that we're in that mode of I'm preparing myself for that event I'm different because of it. So our Bible in a nutshell this year, we will, like last year, be taking one chapter out of each book. Now, we won't be studying each book, but just a chapter. The first day of your homework is kind of an overview, a background, so it gives you an idea of what the chapter is based on. And we're going to start out with Psalms. Psalms has been divided into five books And we studied three of those at the end of this last Bible study year. We'll hit two of them this year. 
And I'm excited about the two that the Lord had me pick because we're going to look at God's answer to our question, why isn't life fair? I'm going to delve into that and what God's answer to that is because we've all asked it because life isn't fair. Why isn't it fair? And then we're going to bask in how you and I are so wonderfully made and planned in Psalm 139. Then we'll move, excuse me, into the three books written by King Solomon. One a book on wisdom, book of Proverbs, then Ecclesiastes, really Solomon's conclusion at the end of his life, what life should be and, and is about. And then Song of Solomon, and I'm not sure what to do with that book. You know, I, I have struggled with it, I've stared at it, and it's just, you know, the analogy of it being like Christ and the church fits sometimes, but then there's some verses, it's like, I you shake your head like, nah, that's my Jesus doesn't look at me like that, and I can't talk to him like that, so, so it doesn't work, and yet we're, we're kind of mixed as far as single and marriage and all of that, and, and so I can't see it as just presenting it as it is, so I don't know what to do with it, because it's in the Word of God, I felt, I thought, I'm just not going to do it, and then I feel guilty, and so, I don't know, so we may be doing... <laughs> Solomon, we may not. Um, And then we get to the prophets, major and minor, and we'll start with Isaiah. Now, chronologically, it starts with Jonah, who preached not to God's people, Israel, but to Israel's enemy, those in Nineveh. And for today's purpose, I want to divide the prophets into five different categories of who they each spoke to. Now, you're not going to be able to write all this down. I'll give you the whole thing. Uh because I'm not going to spend that much time of it, but you all have cell phones. So this is your chance. Just take a picture of the slide, and you've taken all the notes you need on this chart. Because, see, some of the prophets spoke to Gentile nations, Jonah, Nahum, and Obadiah. They spoke to Gentiles. And then some prophets, Hosea, Amos, and Micah, their main thing was they spoke to the northern kingdom of Israel. And then Joel, and Isaiah, and Zephaniah, and Habakkuk, and Jeremiah spoke to the southern kingdom of Israel. And then while Israel was in captivity, God used Daniel and Ezekiel. And then when they returned to Jerusalem, he used Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi to speak to the people. And so, so this is kind of the, this is, these are the prophets we're going to be studying Uh, on a chart in the nutshell, and you should be very thankful that I did this chart because some of the charts out there are very tedious and complicated with way more information than I know any of us would want to know. So what I want to do in the rest of our time together is is just take a little snippet of each one of the, the books written by the prophets. And what I'll do is I'll pull out one verse Uh, that reveals God's message to us in the midst of his warnings and his pleas to come back to him. And I had a lot of fun doing this because I actually just got my Bible out and I started with Isaiah and I started flipping through. And I I was looking through, Lord, show me a a verse that just reveals your heart in the midst of warnings and each one. And so I had a good time uh, yesterday doing this. So we look at the book of Isaiah written or his ministry, and these are years of ministry, not years that he lived, but for each one of these, when I give you dates, there's the years that they were, they served as prophets. So Isaiah served from 740 BC to 681 BC. Now, Isaiah has been referred to by many as a miniature Bible, but in a way it, it reveals the, the heart of a lot of Christians, how they see the Old Testament, because the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, there's 39 chapters in the Old Testament. The first 39 chapters uh, is filled with warnings and judgments. And then the second 27 chapters, there's 27 books in the New Testament, it's said that they declare a message of hope. But those first 39 chapters, there's a whole lot of love and grace and mercy in those first chapters. One continual theme in Isaiah is God's very different perspective regarding Israel's mindset of working and and earning his love rather than just worshiping him. So 
It's not done in the spirit of worship and, and love. God wasn't interested. But see, in the very beginning in Isaiah 1, 18, when, when Isaiah is described as a book of judgment, we see these words of the Lord. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They are as, though they are red at, like crimson, they shall be as wool. So this is the heart of our God. You know, as he's warning them, as he's, he's telling them judgment is coming, what does he say? I don't want judgment. Come now, let us reason together. I'm all about making you clean. And then Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called a youth and, and sometimes resisted that calling to because he had hard prophecies to proclaim. And he's known as the, the weeping prophet because as he proclaimed those hard judgments to the, to the people of God, he cried. It was hard. And, and how that represents the heart of God. And so in the midst, again, of proclaiming judgments, we have Jeremiah 29, 11, 13. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's the heart of our God. And then the book of Lamentations follows the book of Jeremiah because it was written by Jeremiah soon after the fall of Jerusalem. Everything falling apart. The, the temple was destroyed. Jerusalem as a city was destroyed. The people were taken captive. Lamentations means weeping. And yet in the midst of such horrible, hard times, this is what Jeremiah wrote. Through the Lord's mercies, we're not consumed. Jerusalem was consumed. The temple was consumed. But hey, wake up. Through the Lord's mercies, we weren't consumed. Why? Because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And then we'll hit the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's pronouncements begin with warnings of impending judgment and then a message of deliverance from their captivity along with some incredible prophecies that we have seen take place and have yet to see take place. And in the midst of all of that, in the midst of a time of captivity again, the Lord has Ezekiel, Ezekiel say to his people, although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles in captivity of, of heathen nations, and although I have scattered them among the countries, I love this, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. You ever feel scattered sometimes, maybe in your workplace, school? And God's promise here is, but, but I'm going to be a little sanctuary for you. I'm, I'm still that place to run to, to hide, to regroup. I'm your banner. Daniel. Daniel's life and ministry bridged the entire 70-year period of Babylonian captivity. And we'll get to see Daniel's character as he chose the ways of God over the ways of Babylon, how he personally walked with the Lord, about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the times of the fiery furnace, the lion's den, as well as some very powerful prophecies. And in the midst of that, Daniel declared this about God. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. Wrote it in Babylon when heathen men were, were kings and everything seemed so out of control. And, and Daniel said, oh, my God's got it. Hosea. Hosea's theme is that of Israel's harlotry, using the example of Hosea's wife who was a prostitute and so very unfaithful to him. And, and God said, you're going to represent me and you're going to take her back. Because Israel had so walked away from the Lord and, and worshipped other gods. 
and left him, the God who alone could love Israel. But see, praise God, the story doesn't end with how we think it should. You know, God should have said, you want those other idols? Go. Just go. Worship the other gods. What does he do? He, he uses Hosea and then to write and to act out his love for his people. And so Hosea says, speaking for the Lord, what he says to his people, Israel, that had been so unfaithful, what he says to you and me in those times when we're unfaithful, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and judgment in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And, and as I said when I, we started tonight, you know, in, in praying, I felt so strongly as I was coming up with these verses as God wants to really drive some of these verses home individually. It's like there's a certain verse that is for a certain person and another verse is for another certain person. So as I read them, don't be in that mindset of, oh, this is what God said to Israel. He really wants to minister individually to each of us tonight. So he has that, that message for those that have walked away. Beautiful message. Joel. Joel was probably written about in the early 800s BC, but possibly some say um, late uh, 830s, like 835 to 841, which had made him the first prophet to write, if that's true. Joel's warnings were to the southern kingdom, and he compared God's judgment to locusts. And he said they, they will inflict severe damage to everything in its past. You know? And as he's making these predictions of how, how locusts are just going to eat up and destroy everything, warning, he writes this. As God warns, he's always, we're going to see this over and over again. As God warns, he always gives us a, a, a hope of, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. And so he says in verses 25 and 26 of Joel 2, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. See, he predicted the locust is going to eat you up. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust. And I love that he, he kind of delineated each one because it's like whatever it is that has torn at your life, I'm going to restore what it has done to you. My great army, which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. And then we have Amos. Amos' message was that Israel's prosperity had led them to sin and the warning of, it's, it's time. God's got to judge your sin. Twelve times Amos wrote the word transgression as he identified four specific transgressions. And he warned them, God's not going to turn his face away. He's not going to ignore what you are doing. And what hit me as I scanned through Amos yesterday is that I underlined this phrase five times. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Aren't those sad words? You know, God reaches out and he's reaching out to the people through Amos, and, and God is saying five times, yet you haven't returned to me. I've done all these things, yet you haven't returned to me. God's grace, in spite of the fact that he could say that to them, that they hadn't returned. In Amos 5, 14 and 15, he says, seek good and not evil, that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate, it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Try me. Pull your life together. It just may be that I can change things around, God says. Obadiah, he spoke to the Edomites. They were the descendants of Esau. Remember, there were Jacob and Esau, twins. From Jacob came the 12 tribes of Israel. From Esau came the Edomites who twice in history failed to come to the aid of Israel, and, and God didn't forget it. And so Obadiah is reminding them of how they didn't take care of God's people. 
and he pronounced total destruction. And Edom is, became virtually non-existent as of the first century. And as I looked through Obadiah, I thought, I have an underlined one verse. You know, what, what am I going to show you? You know, because, and I realized, well, of course there's no grace in this book. Because it's a people that rebelled against God and had no intention of coming to him. So there's no grace in it. I thought, what a sad book. But then I found something. And I love this because he still had a message for his people in the midst of a message to a very rebellious heathen nation. And he said, but on Mount Zion. In other words, but in my city, in my Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance. As he proclaimed to the Edomites, there's no deliverance from you. You don't want it, there won't be. And then he said, but on Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. There shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their Edomites' possessions. You see such love of God in that. And then Jonah. Another message to people who were not of Israel, the Ninevites. But unlike the Edomites, they repented. And we'll see in Jonah God's concern and mercy for all men, including the Gentiles. And the theme here is repentance from sin and what God does when we repent. And Jonah's a story of mercy, triumphing over judgment. So in the midst of, of Jonah being told, go tell the Ninevites, repent, or I'm going to destroy them. Jonah had something to say about God, identifying God. Hold on, my computer is not plugged in. There. Okay. And his message was this. Jonah prayed to the Lord, and he says, Oh, Lord. Was not this what I said when I was still in my country? In other words, I don't want to go tell these evil people to repent because they're going to do it. And I know what you're like. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, that you're slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. I know this about you, God. You're going to forgive them, aren't you? Yes, that's what God always wants to do. And Micah... The theme is, enough is enough, as Micah rebuked anyone who would use their social or political power for personal gain. One-third of the book exposes their sins, and one-third pronounces the punishment that God is about to send them because of their sin. And then, as so many myths in the Old Testament, one-third of the book holds out the hope of restoration. And we'll find that throughout these books as we study. So Micah says, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Remember they were using their power, their position for personal gain. And God said, wait, this is what I want from you. And then Nahum Jonah pronounced judgment upon Nineveh, and they repented. Nahum wrote, prophesied, about 150, 200 years later. He's back at Nineveh again. He's telling Nineveh again, repent, because they'd returned back to their old, old ways. But this time the people made no changes. And so God carried out his warning, and the city was wiped out within 50 years. And so again like Obadiah's message to the Edomites, no grace was offered. Instead, a word of comfort to the people who did belong to God. Behold, on the, mount, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O oh, Judah, back to his people, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. In other words, God is telling his people, his love, the good news, and that their enemy had been cut off because they refused to repent. 
Habakkuk. I remember when we studied Habakkuk several years ago and discovering that part of Habakkuk is God's answer to the question, God, where are you when bad things happen? Because Habakkuk was in a place where, where he understood that, that a very, very evil nation was going to be used by God to come against Israel. And he couldn't figure it out. It's like, why would you use really, really bad people to judge us? They're worse than us. And he asked God, and he, and he could not figure it out, and it didn't make sense. And like us sometimes, where are you when bad things happen, Lord? And, and why are you doing it this way? This doesn't make sense. And he wrestled with the Lord, and he, and he had the freedom to ask questions. But then he came to a conclusion at the end of the book. And this is a conclusion we come to when we really allow the Lord to minister to us in hard times. He said, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there may be, and there be no herd in the stalls. Uh, stop there. See, this wasn't, we, we might say, you know, well, maybe if this happens, if these kind of things happen, if I don't, if I'm not able to pay the rent, if that person does leave me, if, if I don't have any food, those kind of things, and they're all ifs. But see, Habakkuk knew this was what was going to happen. This was going to be the state of Israel. This was a sure thing. So though these things happen, Habakkuk said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. See, though all the things that we fear actually happen, he says, yet I will rejoice. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on high hills. And I added this. I was to the chief musician with stringed instruments. And I included that because it wasn't just Habakkuk's conclusion. He was saying, I want the people to sing this song because it's going to get really, really bad in Israel, and people, we need to start singing this song. This is a song for all of us, and it's a song not just for all of Israel, but for you and me when, when hard times are threatening us. Uh, we'll get to walk through Habakkuk's journey and see how did he go from, God, I don't get you, to God, no matter what happens, I will rejoice in you. That, that's a beautiful journey, and we want to go on it with him. Zephaniah. In just three short chapters, Zephaniah began with warnings of utter consumption against Judah and Jerusalem, and he ended with some of the sweetest words in the Bible as he pronounced his faithfulness and love and his good intentions for the people. One of my favorites, uh, Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save he will rejoice over you with gladness. You, me. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And then the last three books of the Old Testament are the last three books chronologically. And they are words spoken to God's people who had returned to Jerusalem to their homeland from captivity. And the first one was Haggai. Purpose of this book is that Haggai was called by God to encourage the people to finish the construction of the temple. They'd started it, and then they had some opposition, and, and they quit. Ever done that? You know, you start something, and it starts getting hard, and, and there's opposition. He's going, I can't do this. And here was God's answer to them. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, and here's his message. I'm with you. I'm with you, says the Lord. And I've walked with the Lord long enough that if I can get a hold of that when I'm working through something and, and I sense the Lord going, I'm with you. That's all I need. It's like, okay, Lord, you're with me in this. That's all I need. I don't need my strength. I don't need anything good about me. I just need you to be with me and to know that you are in this. And that's what he, his message was to the people. Build that temple because I'm with you. And then Zechariah just about the same time as Haggai. Zechariah's emphasis was an encouragement to get back to the good ways of following the Lord, to reinstate the priesthood and, and some of the other practices that they had forgotten during their 70 years of captivity. 
And Zechariah gave us some incredible prophecies of the first and second coming of the, the high priest, our Lord Jesus. And Isaiah, I mean Zechariah 1 3 says, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. Now, you ever think you get back out there that far and you wonder what his message is? And his message to us when we get out there is, come back, and I will be there. What if he just said, come back, and he didn't know what he was going to do? Again, if he had ways of dealing with us when we came back. But he says, you come back to me, I'll come back to you. Simple as that. We can count on it. And lastly, the last book of the Old Testament that recorded the very last words to God's people before the birth of Jesus, is in Malachi. And although Malachi addressed a people who had returned from exile, they had also returned to their old ways. Back to their old ways already. Corrupt priests, wicked practices, and a false sense of security that they were okay with God. Seven times in four short chapters, God used the phrase, yet you say, but you say. And, and it was a result of God accusing them of certain activities and actions and unfaithfulness, and, and, he, and he'd accuse them and go, yet you say, but you say, but you justify yourself. Yet, and in the midst of that, God shared his heart towards those who would heed his warnings and his words. And, and we're familiar with these verses I'm going to show you, but in context, it's really sweet because God has told Malachi to tell the people, you're doing it all wrong. God, men, you're treating your wives poorly. Priests, you're, you're treating the people poorly. People, you're not serving me the way you're supposed to. You're not giving financially the way you're supposed to. And then from that... It says, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. In other words, those who got what God was saying, you know, the ones that said, yeah, but, and justified themselves, he's not talking about them. He's talking to those who listened to his rebuke and his warnings. And throughout the Old Testament, he's got rebuke, he's got warnings. And, and this is for we who would fear him and talk to one another about him and get what he is saying, and, and turn from any of our wicked ways and turn to him. And I said, the Lord listened and heard them. And so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. And he says this, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on that day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. What a different reaction. You know, God confronted the people and, and they made excuses. And then there's the people who feared him and talked about him and listened to him. And he wrote it in a book. I love thinking about that when I'm talking to someone about the Lord and getting excited about the Lord and thinking, I wonder if he's up in heaven going, listen, listen to Kathy. Listen to what she's saying right now. She's talking to me, angels. She's talking about me. You know, the holy God, you can affect him like that. I can affect him like that. That's amazing. And then he says, they're mine. I'll call them my jewels. You, me, his jewels. So there you have it, almost an hour of a capsule, a little capsule of what we're going to be diving into in the next 20 lessons or so. Lots of warnings in most of the books, but see, look at God's heart again in Malachi. We who fear him and speak to one another about him, he listens and he hears. And he says he'll call us his jewels. You know, if we tackle these books the way he would have us to, and, and we get from these books a, a healthy respect of him and a, and a joy, so we want to be talking about him. We have this promise that, that he'll listen and he'll write about us, and, he, and he'll say, I guess, to the angels, look, they're my jewels. This is my jewel. I want that. I want that for all of us. And 
And amazing, just as I said that, you know, there's all kinds of people who like to make you feel good and tell you things and give you psychology, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And, and I just stood before you and, and, and said, you know what? God wants to call you as jewels. That's a phenomenal statement, and I, and I don't have to go home and go, oh, is that right? Was I just trying to pep him up? No, God said it. We can believe it. So let's approach him with that kind of excitement and approach this study with that kind of excitement. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. When we think about the way we are, we don't get why you would ever look at us and, and call us something so precious as a jewel, and even more precious than that, God, that you would say, she's mine. But thank you, Lord, that that's how you see us. That's how you see those that are yours. When, and when we listen to you and take heed, I know it puts a smile on your face. And Lord, we just so desire to make you smile. So Lord, for each of us, I pray that you have ministered in, in some way tonight. Anyone especially, Lord, that has felt like they, they just messed up too much. May they see that your heart is just return to me, and we'll make it all right. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's worship this great God.